We begin this news hour here in Doha, where a major prisoner swap between the U.S. and Iran is underway after two years of indirect negotiations. Tehran is freeing five Amer Iranian Americans that Washington says have been unjustly detained. The U.S. is expected to release five Iranians from its jails. Oman, Qatar and Switzerland have all played a part in facilitating negotiations between Iran and the United States. Three of the five American prisoners have been named. They all face charges of espionage in Iran. They and their families deny the charge, though. In turn, five Iranians that Washington accuses of secretly working for Tehran will be released. They include a political scientist, a college professor and an exporter. The U.S. released Iranian funds that were frozen in South Korea, too. Now, that money first went to Switzerland and then to Qatar. Six billion dollars of Iranian oil revenue is now in a bank account in Doha. The U.S. says Tehran can only use that money for humanitarian needs. Let's go live to Imran Khan, who's at the airport here in Doha. So, Imran, as I was explaining through that graphic, a lot of moving pieces. Is it now in process? Absolutely. Let me just show you where I am right now. I'm at Doha International Airport. The plane's likely to arrive uh, on that runway over there where it will taxi to perhaps where that plane you can see. Uh, from there, the freed prisoners will be taken into that terminal building just over there. This all began when $6 billion of Iranian funds were released to a Qatari bank account. But even that was complicated. Those funds were seized in South Korea under sanctions law by the Americans. They were then transferred under this deal to Switzerland. Switzerland then transferred those funds to Qatar. On receipt, the prisoner exchange was allowed to take place. They're flying in from Tehran. Uh, it's about a two-hour journey. It's unclear whether the plane is actually taken off or not. But this $6 billion is actually very controversial within the U.S. Republicans are saying it's effectively a ransom payment uh, for the prisoners. The Biden administration saying it's not a ransom payment. This is simply the only way to get these prisoners freed. Now, when they're in that terminal building, they'll meet with uh, representatives of the Qatari delegation, plus uh, the U.S. Embassy here and members of uh, the State Department. Once that happens, they're likely to go fairly quickly back to the United States, where if previous prison exchanges are anything to go by, they'll be given a medical evaluation and a security debriefing. Now, President Raisi has been speaking. He says that the, pres the prisoners are in good health uh, and that this is a good deal for all sides. But it's also controversial in Iran. And once again, it comes down to that $6 billion. The Iranians are only allowed to access those funds for humanitarian reasons. Now, President Raisi has said these, are, these funds are for the benefit of the Iranian people, but the Americans say if there's any hint that the funds are being used for, say, for example, weapons purchases, then they'll ask the Qataris to cut off those funds. All right, good stuff there. Imran Khan from the airport in Doha. Let's now hear from the Iranian foreign minister who confirmed the prisoner swap is taking place. In the framework of our active foreign policy, we have unlocked our frozen assets from South Korea. Today, God willing, these funds will be in the hands of our government and people, and this government will spend it accordingly to the needs of the people. Abbas Asani is a senior research fellow at the Center for Middle East Strategic Studies, joins us by Skype from Tehran. Good to have you with us. So, controversial deal, as our reporter was saying. How is this being viewed in Iran? Uh, well, Sami, uh, this is quite important because, you know, uh, the timing of the uh, this development is important. And uh, it seems that, yet again, as what happened to the 2015 nuclear deal, again, the exchanges and the interaction is taking place between Iran and the United States. And we are seeing a diminishing role from for the Europeans in the engagement uh, regarding the nuclear negotiations as well as in the region. Uh, this is the final phase of the uh, prisoner swap, but this could be a beginning for extended and further talks on nuclear negotiations, as well as lifting the sanctions against Iran. But there's an issue whether that the Americans will be able to do it before their election uh, in the U.S. or not. 
uh, at least I think the talks can move in direction of the targets and the goals of the, that 2015 nuclear deal. And this is quite important. Uh, so the spillover effect is important in this regard, and this can be a new beginning for further talks between Iran and the United States, however indirect. I was going to ask you about that, if this could be the basis for a continuation of negotiations on other issues. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, on the sideline of the United Nations uh, Gen uh, General Assembly, there is the possibility of holding indirect talks uh, and continuing the negotiations vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the nuclear deal. And uh, I think this is a process which will need more time. And uh, while there has been some discussions about the escalation about uh, between Iran and the United States, I think this can contribute to that process. Uh, but uh, how long it will take, it depends on the both parties. But this is important that, uh, as I said, this is taking place between Iran and the United States. And this will depend on the role that Europeans can play in this regard. Uh, we are have been seeing some signs that they have been also, uh, let's say, uh, making their own approach toward Iran a bit more milder following the protests taking place in Iran previous year. Uh, and uh, the timing is important because this is happening at the anniversary of those unrest and protests in Iran. And this uh, somehow suggests that they're calculations have been changing toward Iran and they have been shifting toward, uh, toward interaction with Iran. How critical will it be the issue of who decides how this money is spent, the six billion that has been unfrozen, and what constitutes humanitarian needs? Uh, well, this is quite clear, Sami, because there have been discussions that how they can spend this money. Uh, Iran and American size, what they have in common is that these are going to be spent for non-sanctioned goods. And I, I have been hearing from Iranian officials that will suffice them to, to be able to buy the commodities that they need in the country. So, and there will not be a, any specific problem in this regard. Uh, so generally, you know, we can put it that it can be used the amount of money for non-sanctioned goods. Uh, which can uh, include the humanitarian goods or uh, the others as well, which are not been under sanctions. Given that we've got elections coming up in the U.S., given that there's been criticism within the U.S. over this deal, particularly the allegations that the Iranians simply held people as hostages rather than arresting people who there were reasonable grounds to suspect they'd done something wrong, given all of this background that's going on in the U.S., do you think the Biden administration really has a lot of scope to make any progress with Iran? Uh, well, this is one of the uh, problems that Biden administration has had so far, and that's why they have not been able to make a decision on reviving the nuclear deal. But they say that this is a ransom, but uh, let's not forget that this is Iran's it's, uh, owns money, and this is not something extra they want to demand from the United States. Uh, and the, the, uh, from Iranian perspective, the, uh, the view is that that's the American side who has tried to connect this prisoner's issue to the money. They could have released Iranian money beforehand, they can, and then they could uh, focus on prisoner swap only. Uh, so, uh, and the Iran uh, wants it, the money that uh, comes from its, uh, you know, selling its oil uh, to other countries. And this is not something extra that it demands. Uh, so, uh, it's exactly vice versa here in Tehran. And they said that Americans have tried to help hostage, you know, Iranian money by, let's say, uh, bringing up other issues. And they were hoping to do this after the nuclear deal uh, was finalized. But uh, due to the failure in reviving the 2015 nuclear agreement, they decided to make this happen. Maybe they could use this as a card in their elections. And this is a kind of, let's say, politicizing humanitarian issue. And this is uh, what is being brought up in Tehran, criticizing Biden administration. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that, Abbas Aslani. Thank you, Sam.
Now, Qatar has mediated in several long-running conflicts. In 2008, street battles erupted in Beirut between government forces, Hezbollah and other militias. Qatar hosted talks that led to a framework for parliamentary elections. They were held the following year. In 2011, Sudanese government representatives met rebel leaders from Darfur in Doha. Their agreement, called the Doha Document for Peace, was one of several attempts to mediate the long-running conflict in western Sudan. In 2020, you'll remember the U.S. and Taliban officials meeting in Qatar for the first time after 20 years of war. Now, they signed the Doha Accords, agreeing to the withdrawal of U.S. forces and a commitment that Afghanistan would not be used to launch attacks against the U.S. The agreement was negotiated without the participation of the then Afghan government. Now, in 2022, representatives from 40 different opposition groups in Chad came to Doha to meet with Chad's military government. They agreed to a ceasefire and to open reconciliation talks. The country's main rebel group, called FACT, didn't take part, but didn't, did take part, but didn't sign, rather. Well, Nasser bin Hamad al-Khalifa is a former Qatari ambassador to the United Nations. He joins us now live from Paris. Good to have you with us. So, first of all, it took almost two years of indirect negotiations. What finally enabled this deal to come together? Well, uh, thank you for uh, uh, hosting me. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a very good news for the families of the prisoners. And uh, I am happy for them. But uh, you know the you know the process uh, of reaching such a happy ending took uh, quite a long time, uh, and uh, it was the trust to the two parties of the uh, uh, good offices of Qatar that led to such uh, ending. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, for the past two two years, we've been observing Qatari officials moving back and forth between Tehran and Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, such outcome uh, is good for uh, both countries, especially the people who are, uh, you know, happen to be a prisoner and their families, and it's also good for our region because the more we solve a problem or a problem solved around us, the more uh, our region become more stable. And uh, for me, I, I think, you know, this is a good day. All right. We understand as part of the deal, $6 billion is going to be held in Qatari banks. Who decides how that money can be spent? What constitutes humanitarian needs? As a matter of fact, these are technical issues which I am not privy to, but I am sure there is a mechanism where Qatar will be involved in to make sure that the money is spent on the, uh, for the purposes they were agreed to. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the future will be uh, the judge, but I hope everybody will be committed to whatever they committed themselves to. Uh, so, uh, because Qatar in this situation is a guarantor that uh, uh, such money and uh, uh, such funds will be spent on uh, goods which will help the Iranian uh, people. There's been some expectation or hope that maybe this could form the basis of negotiations on other issues. Is Qatar trying to play a role to try and resolve issues between the U.S. and Iran on wider other issues? Well, I am sure, you know, Qatar uh, uh, has been involved uh, in negotiation between these two countries. And uh, Qatar, as an ally of the United States and a friend and neighbor of Iran, uh, will be uh, happy to play any role which will bring them together and create a stable region. You see, we, we are surrounded by a lot, of a, a lot of problems in our region, and uh, it's time that we, we get rid of this instability, and it's time that people work together, governments work together, so, uh, you, you know, peace will, uh, will prevail, Investment will grow, and the cooperation will be the, the, new, the new languages. 
Having said that, uh, we understand that uh, this is good for Iran, but also for the for President uh, Biden, since you know their election is coming uh, next year. This is something which he can show uh, to to his uh, people. Though it is very beneficial to the prisoner, and I am happy for it. All right. Thank you so much, for Ambassador, for talking to us. Thank you.